It's crazy to think, considering the amount of hype surrounding this brand, that Polestar has only ever made two cars and mass-produced one since becoming a standalone manufacturer back in 2017. The Polestar 1, that was a proof of concept, an achingly pretty limited production coupe. The 2, that was the real deal, an electric car so beautiful and so beautifully made that it makes a Tesla Model 3 look like a plastic frog. This coming from an entirely impartial Polestar 2 owner, of course. Now it's time for the 3, and as is the way of the world, well, it's a bloody great big SUV. We don't much like those here at Fully Charged, but Polestar claims it does SUVs a bit differently. It says that this is an SUV purpose-built for the electric, sustainable future. What does that mean? Don't know. Let's find out. This is the Polestar 3, and this is the Fully Charged Show. Like the Fully Charged Show? Then you will love our six live shows being held around the world in 2023, starting with Sydney, Australia on March the 11th and 12th. I'm here with one of the more senior designers on the Polestar design team. Uh, could I just ask, madam, what are your thoughts on the design of the Polestar 3? Remarkable. Right, Polestar 3, here it is. Let's talk about it. A bit of context before we begin. We have not a lot of time, I mean really not a lot of time, inside this little studio. All the media in the entire world are behind that door, waiting for their turn uh, with the car. So I'm just going to cheat and read off my phone. And there's a very strong chance that we get collared midway through filming this and we have to go film the rest of it outside. We'll make it work. We always do. Polestar 3. What is it? Well, it's a bloody great big SUV. It's damn near five meters and damn near 2.6 tons of Swedish magnificence. If you can't beat them, join them, is very much the thinking behind this car. People are going to carry on buying SUVs for a long time. So why not make sure that they are at least buying greener, cleaner SUVs? More on that later. Let's jump in with price. 79,900 pounds is the price for the launch car. The launch car does come with dual motor, long range, pilot and plus pack, basically every box on the options sheet ticked. Uh, it's a lot of car, it's a lot of car, and it's a lot of money. We don't have official numbers for the subsequent variants. They haven't even officially said that they're gonna do a shorter range single motor one, but you assume that they are. If you're calling this one the dual motor, long range, it implies the existence of a standard range single motor speculation. My guess is, down the line, we're going to see a simpler version of this car, starting from somewhere in the 65, high 60,000s region. So it is substantially more than a Polestar 2. Is it substantially more car than a Polestar 2? We're about to find out. First deliveries of these car will be Q4 of 2023, so still a ways away. Initially, they're going to be just produced in China, but from early 2024, they're also going to be manufacturing these bad boys in the US. And from around mid-2024, that US factory will actually serve the North American market. And you do get the impression with this car that China and North America are very much on Polestar's minds because, well, it's big. And, and just quickly, one thing I do really like about Polestar is we know what their plans are. We have a clear understanding of which models to expect. It's taken about five years to give us the first two cars, but we can basically expect a car every year for the immediate future. So this is the three big SUV. Next we get the four smaller SUV, think Porsche Macan size. Then we get the five, that's the artist formerly known as Precept, the big kind of Model S style, proper luxe, proper high-end thing. And then the six will be the O2 Roadster. So those are the next few Polestar models that are coming. We know that. But today we're focusing on the three. And for me, the three is potentially going to be the most divisive Polestar of them all because here is the big question that i want to get an answer to today how on earth can a 2.6 ton suv with a huge battery be sustainable polestar is a brand that prides itself on its emphasis on sustainability more so than any of its rivals is this the right sort of car for the polestar brand to be making do we need big suvs in the future should we not be leaving these behind entirely these are the questions that we'll answer but first of all Let's have a nosy around some of the cool stuff, because there's a lot of cool stuff.
Beginning at the front of the car then, this is quite an interesting feature. This, well, it's a wing. There's a wing on the nose of this big whopping SUV. This is familiar from the preset concept. Do you remember that? This had a very similar setup here. And this is an aero feature. One of the big issues with SUVs is they're not especially aerodynamic. There's a lot of turbulence created by this big flat nose. Well, this is gonna help air flow over the top of the car in a cleaner way, increasing efficiency, allegedly. We'll talk about efficiency a bit more later. Couple things of note at the front, smart zone. This is a new thing again, off the precept. We're gonna see this on all Polestars going forward. Uh, Thomas, the CEO, had a really good line about this in the presentation last night. He said that grills on old ICE cars were a symbol of their inefficiency. Old petrol cars need grills to breathe in air, to cool themselves down due to all the heat caused by the energy that they're wasting. It's a symbol of inefficiency. Well. This is no longer a grill for breathing, it's now a smart panel for seeing. Ooh, I like that. Lots of sensors, lots of cameras. This car will be available with LiDAR next year to make it ready for full autonomous driving, good gracious me. I don't think I'm gonna to get too deep on the design analysis today because it's so subjective. I think it looks fantastic. You tell me what you think in the comments below. I will talk about these dual blade headlights, obviously a Polestar staple. These can do something very fancy. One of my favorite things about my Polestar 2 is the automatic high beams. I can have the lights on full beam. And when a car comes the other way, it just dips out that little slice of headlight so as not to dazzle oncoming traffic. These new lights can do that for up to eight cars at any one time. Good Lord. Let's come around the side. Which is gonna be tricky for Andy because it's quite a small studio, but it's a big car. It's a big, big car. 4.9 meters long is the Polestar 3. Wheels, you can have 21s or 22s. Um, they don't look especially aero -y, but this is what happens when you have a company where the CEO is a designer. If you think about every new car as the result of an argument between the designers, the aerodynamicists, the engineers, the financiers, you have to bear in mind at Polestar, the designers get a lot of say because the head of design answers to and another designer. So we're going to see examples of this. Smaller wheels with aero covers would increase range, but Polestar being Polestar, wanting a car to be beautiful, to be desirable, there's going to be a few sacrifices in the name of it factor. Hence, the big old 22s. The platform, I do believe, is a bespoke EV platform, which was developed in conjunction between Volvo and Geely. It's the same platform that we're going to see in the new EX90 Volvo electric SUV. It already underpins a few Geely models. Um, good news, that means lots of space. It means wheels pushed out a little bit further. We do have a very long bonnet, which is something you would perhaps associate with uh, an ICE car. But again, this is an example of Polestar prioritizing design and it is a good looking thing, so I'll allow it. It really is quite a sleek and sporty looking thing. It's quite a lot lower than you think it's gonna be for a big long SUV, despite the fact that it does have a high SUV driving position. And what they've done to achieve that is just rake the seats back into quite a reclined sports car position. So you're still up high like an SUV, you still feel like you're lording over the road, but you also have that reclined sporty feel. Fancy some performance figures? With the performance pack added, the Polestar 3 will have 510 horsepower, 910 newton meters of torque, and sprint from 0 to 62 miles an hour in 4.7 seconds. More interestingly, this giant SUV has 50-50 weight distribution, torque vectoring, adaptive air suspension, and active dampers that can adjust themselves every two milliseconds. This may all seem a bit extra for a giant SUV, but this is the Polestar way. And this is what happens when you have a man like Joachim Ridholm in charge of your chassis. You might remember Joachim from our Arctic adventure earlier this year. This is the man who did laps of an ice track sitting in the front so that he could better assess the movement of his suspension components. He has reached deep inside his box of tricks for the Polestar 3 to ensure that this giant 2.6 ton car drives like a Polestar. Now, the battery. Should we have a word about the battery? It's not small, 111 kilowatt hours nominal, 108 kilowatt hours usable. It's a really, really big battery range up to 300 
380 miles. Up to 380 miles, that for me says 300 miles, real world range, potentially. Efficiency, this is key. The number that they've given us is the optimal efficiency with the perfect spec is 23.1 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Now, in the way that I understand it, after some lazy maths, that's about 2.68 miles per kilowatt hour. That's distinctly average. That's distinctly average efficiency for a new electric car. It's less than an Ionic 5. It's less than any Tesla that you can buy. Charging happens back here, conventional location, up to 250 kilowatts charging speeds, uh, bi-directional charging as standard on the Polestar 3. By the way, they gave us a big spiel about vehicle to grid and how they feel that's an important part of the future. So great to see that coming as standard on this car. Round the back, very quick word on the design. We've got this rear spoiler, which of course is geared towards uh, increased efficiency, not increasing downforce. No issue as far as traction with a 2.6 ton curb weight. Uh, beautiful light bar, very distinctive, not dissimilar to the one on the Polestar 2, but just flipped upside down. See that? Interesting, fun. I like these little accents on it as well. Boots, not actually as huge as you might think, 484 litres. There's also a 32 litre frunk. It's pretty big. It's not quite as big as some of its rivals, but actually the reason for that is that Polestar has very deliberately prioritised cabin space. So in a second, we'll find out just how roomy it is. Now, a quick word on sustainability, because so far we haven't really talked that much about what makes this the sustainable SUV for the future. And a big part of that comes from the transparency with which Pulsar goes around manufacturing. Now, as soon as this car goes into production, Polestar is going to produce a life cycle assessment. It's going to get a really clear picture of what the exact carbon footprint is of every single Polestar 3 that leaves the factory. And then they're going to make ongoing attempts to reduce that figure. And this all amounts to the Polestar Zero, which is a project um, targeting a carbon neutral car leaving the factory by 2030. I do want to highlight that because it could easily be mistaken for more PR spiel, but actually this is something Polestar does uniquely in the automotive space, being really open and transparent about, okay, this is how much CO2 we're currently creating with every car we build. Next year, it's going to be this much. And by 2030, it's going to be zero. Yeah, we, uh, we got kicked out of the studio. It's fair enough, really. The entire world's press are hit. The entire world's press want their turn in the studio. We had ours, and now it's over. So we're gonna do the rest of the video from this car, which is kind of being shared among the communal space. I do apologize if you see random journalists from all over the world sort of peering through the window at certain points during this interior review. We're making it work. So, Polestar 3 interior. First things first, I'm gonna pop on my Polestar 2 hat. I'm going to analyze this as a Polestar 2 owner because it's a lovely interior, but there are a couple of very small gripes with it. Number one, slightly fingerprinty material in the middle. That actually is still here. Make of that what you will. You don't have to touch it as much because there's only one button here now, this play pause button, which brings me nicely to pedantic Polestar 2 gripe number two, the play pause button. It's a bit yucky to press. It felt like someone got gum stuck in it, but now oh, tactile. Oh yes. But the most important Polestar 2 gripe is the cup holders. And I'm, I'm so sorry if you don't own a Polestar 2. This is really boring for you. But Polestar 2 owners, you know what I'm about to say. The cup holder positioning is a disaster. You have to choose between cup holder or armrest. That's a choice no one should have to make. But now, look at this. Got two lovely cup holders right there, easily covered up, and I can keep my armrest. Delightful. Huge, I know, very exciting. Let's move on to more general things. It's a very Polestar interior, that would be fair to say. Very minimalist, very clean, very beautifully put together. But we've got a lovely new look steering wheel. This is decidedly more sporty in feel than the one in the two. Again, small gripe with the Polestar 2. It didn't feel that good to sort of hook your fingers around for really spirited driving. This one feels like it was designed for exactly that got these lovely clicky buttons here. I don't really know what they do because I can't turn this car on and tell you, unfortunately. We'll do that next time. 
big 14 and a half inch central screen. That's four, four and a half inches bigger than the Polestar 2 screen and a smaller one in front of you. So really drawing the focus towards this main screen, idea being that when you're driving, keep it simple. And then when you need to do stuff, nice big screen to accommodate said stuff. And I have had someone show me on an iPad what this new look Android software looks like. And it seems very pretty. A couple of standout things that I noticed from that demonstration, your maps are always present. So a gripe with the Polestar 2 software is when you click off your maps to change music or fiddle around with something, you can't see where you're going. Well, in this, your maps will always stay across the top of the screen, whatever happens. Nice touch. Also noticed during that demonstration, a few extra drive settings um, that we haven't seen from Polestar before. So you can have stiff or firm suspension and there is a performance mode if you want maximum power and you're not too worried about running out of range. Central console, we've got this floating center console thing. You might think, given that this car sits on EV architecture, that Polestar would go for the kind of open plan, flat floor situation, but no, they've stuck to this kind of cockpit feel which I personally feel is better suited to a sporty car. And this is a sporty car. You've still got ample room. Outside of that, it's what you'd expect. In this spec'd up car, I've got a heads up display. I've got my wireless phone charger. You can have massage seat. They're incredibly comfortable, really nice and squashy, but still hug you on the sides. And again, just give you that sporty sensation. And then we'll just finish by quickly talking about some of the materials in here, because of course, emphasis on sustainability. Polestar has been on a mission since the precept concept to kind of redesign our ideas of what a luxury interior should be, should feel like, should be made of. So to that end, we've got this lovely repurposed aluminium in the dash, which is, oh, it's cool to the touch. It's really, really nice. We've got these microfiber seats. So this is essentially a vegan interior. But actually, most vegan interiors are not that vegan because they use crude oil. These ones do not. And what I really like is that in the seat here, Polestar has written that information. So it says, Polestar 3, bio-attributed microtech, no CO2 used. This is something that they want you to be aware of when you're sat in your car, something that you're going to talk about with your mates. Instead of sweeping the greenness under the carpet, make it front and center, make it a talking point of the car. Nice. jack test now bear in mind Polestar have said out loud that they've sacrificed a bit of boot space in favor of lots and lots of cabin space so oh that is lots and lots of cabin space now bear in mind this is quite a low roof lined SUV and yet I am spoilt for room back here we've got this lovely flat floor huge amount of leg room really decent headroom very grateful for this panoramic sunroof which I always think is more for the rear seat occupants than the front ones. And you do want that extra glass in the roof because it's worth noting that like the Polestar 2, because of the high muscular shoulder line, the windows and the windscreen are quite small. So it would feel a little bit claustrophobic without that extra glass, but it does have it. So it doesn't. Gold seat belts, because this is the performance edition car. I really want these in, I don't even want the performance pack. I don't need the dampers. I just wish I had the seat belts, a couple of USB-C ports, back there. I mean, this is where Polestar excels, just making an interior that works well and feels wonderful to sit in. And the three is, is exactly as you would expect in that regard. So, initial thoughts of the Polestar 3? Well, what do you think? Tell us in the comments. I feel like we're gonna have some strong opinions on this particular vehicle. What do we reckon? I, I think it's definitely a Polestar. It looks fantastic, it's beautifully made, the interior is exquisite, it goes like stink, it's probably really good to drive. Polestar, check, 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 check. For me, the burning question remains, does a vehicle like this have a place in the Polestar lineup? Does a 2.6 ton SUV makes sense to a brand that's all about sustainability. Well, pros and cons. Pros, people aren't gonna stop buying big SUVs anytime soon. 
it would be better if they bought them from a brand that is really transparent about its carbon footprint and is working hard to reduce that down to zero by the end of this decade. Moreover, Polestar is still a pretty newish brand and it's gonna need money in order to continue to succeed, in order to carry on with its sustainability mission and selling this thing is gonna make it some money. On the other hand, it's got 111 kilowatt hours of battery matter and I am struggling slightly with that number. The efficiency figure of this car is a bit underwhelming for me. And maybe I'm being harsh, but if Thomas, the CEO, had gotten up on that stage yesterday and said, not only is the interior made of sustainable materials, not only are we being super transparent about the carbon footprints of our car and the traceability of the battery materials, but guess what else? Its battery is half the size of its rivals because it's so bloody efficient that it doesn't need that much battery. That would be a real game-changing car. As it is, it's a very impressive thing, but I can't shake the feeling that they could have just been a little bit bolder. As long as we're trying to make sustainability luxury, why not try and make efficiency sexy as well? Am I asking too much? Maybe, it's only a second car, in fairness. Let's leave it there for now and save the rest for when we actually get to really get our hands on this thing and take it for a proper drive early next year. For the time being, let us know what you think of it in the comments below. Please make sure to like and subscribe. And if you have been, thank you for watching.